Hi friends, my name is Host Eric, and I want to make a quick video before I go to bed. Maybe not super quick, but it's about how the experience I had today is very revelatory about how cognitive functions work in the world, and how we all fill in gaps for each other, unavoidably, as we pressure each other to, to meet our paradigm somewhere. So I'm going to begin this story with and every component of the story links to cognitive functions in some way. So, I'm going to begin this story with the fact that Rachel has serotonin poisoning. Or what you might call that. or ser It's called serotonin syndrome, but it's basically toxic levels of serotonin. And she has some strange kind of scary symptoms. Like uh, not being able to feel or losing some motor control on her fingers and, and hands and feet and stuff like that, right? So, um, the story begins with the fact that for FISI reasons, I failed to prevent this from happening. Um, we went to my friend's house for a Christmas party and on the way there, we, I said, hey, what's that in the street? And I pulled over and I said, oh, look at this. It's some DMT. So we, um, we smoked some at the party. And then, uh, you know, sometime around then she started getting these symptoms. And then we smoked on the next day. And that, she was like, after, after she smoked it then, she really, uh, she just got up and said, I gotta go lie down. And, and she's been feeling sick ever since. It wasn't, until, actually, um, I, I was doing whippets, but all of a sudden, I was, like, tapped out on whippets, and I it was like, she has serotonin syndrome. And I realized abruptly, oh, that's what's wrong with Rachel. Um, but she, being an FE tool user, was slow to tell me she was experiencing symptoms because she doesn't want to be a burden or a bummer to me or something, which is ridiculous because obviously her health is way more important than, than it wouldn't it wouldn't bum me out or be a burden. It's just I want to help make sure she's fine, you know. Anyway, so why did I prevent this from occurring? Well, why didn't I prevent this from occurring? Because of SIFI reasons, I, as I said, which means. Number one, I didn't spend enough attention to, as a general rule, and continue to not spend enough attention to harm prevention overall. Usually, this doesn't bite me in the ass because I don't have that many things to protect, protect from harm. And we live in a pretty safe world. At least, me and Rachel do. So, um... But the most important factor in why I was unable to prevent this from occurring was basically my SI bias. And SI, all SI people are guilty of the same thing, and some more than others, and sometimes it bites you in the ass and sometimes it doesn't. But that thing that we're guilty of is we don't really believe things until we experience them, experience them ourselves. So it's like I had some knowledge that there was the potential for serotonin syndrome before she smoked DMT the first time but she was fine at that time and so when the opportunity came up again I didn't even I, I, I was done worrying about it right I, I had it sort of in the back of my mind like you better watch out with this because I was aware of it and make sure Rachel doesn't 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 have any harms come to her it's not like it, it and well, let me get all befuddled here. I should probably just start this video over, but I, I, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be able to tell this in a less befuddled way, I guess. So I'm just going to continue. Um, so, on TI grounds, of course, it's not my fault. She's responsible for her own health and body, blah, 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 all that stuff. So, when I'm saying I'm blaming myself, this is a purely FI blame. It's saying, well, yeah, Eric, and it doesn't matter if those things are true. You're aware that she's more fragile than you in some sense. In regarding last, uh, last Drogolus, and um, 
and that she's on these psych drugs and stuff. And you're also aware that she doesn't have a great conscious sense of her own physical well-being unless it's unless she's not well, uh, which is common to all NI types. More so first, second, I, I suspect at least so forth. But, um, maybe at least so third, I'm not sure. Regardless, so there's this confluence of weird things going on that caused this problem to occur that linked to both my polar, my, my bad epistemology bias, which is I have to experience something to believe it. Like, you know, before we started dating, she told me she had bipolar mania, and my response to it was... Oh, I'm sure that's just bullshit. I've, I, I've heard about so-called bipolar mania people before, but it sounds like bullshit to me. I mean, it didn't sound like bullshit to me. I just had never experienced it before. And so I'm naturally skeptical of things that don't have a lot of clear emp empirical linkage. Like, you know... Well, put it this way, I was also ten I also had a tendency to generalize from my own experience. I knew that my experience with psych psychology diagnoses and stuff like that was that um it was just psychologists trying to tell people there's something wrong with them when there weren't, by and large. But that was just my experience and it's not representative of the actual field or the actual situation at all. Once I experienced Rachel actually being bipolar mania, you know, being crazy then i believed in it <laughs> i believed it i now i believe it so the thing is i i had this a similar sort of skepticism towards this serotonin thing in the sense that my basic approach was well if we if there's a problem then we'll find out there's a problem with it the, but until we experience it let's figure i mean try it. you know it's like it didn't, it didn't get worked out in great detail, right? But it was more or less like that. So, anyway. We go to the doctor finally today. And she's been experiencing these symptoms for a solid week or so. And I've been ideating about what's going on exactly. And she's been very worried that it might be permanent, quote-unquote. Which it's not going to be. But, um... The, uh... The thing is... So, I diagnosed it correctly. From, is the final conclusion... That my original diagnosis of serotonin syndrome was correct, but the the pathway that that um, I've had to traverse to come to this conclusion finally has been revealing and not direct. So the thing is, when I first speculated that she might have serotonin syndrome, um, I recommended to her that she not take her psych drugs for a few days to you know stop any existing to stop the way the drugs manage her serotonin so that it would go away basically but again here's a cognitive function thing so yes I was right about my diagnosis and yes, I googled it, but I didn't google all three of her drugs. I just thought, well, I know what the SSRI does, and I'm not sure how exactly these other drugs interact with serotonin, but better to not take them and not add to the problem than to take them and possibly add to the problem. So this is the sort of reasoning I'm doing. Well, what didn't I do until like two days later, or almost, I, yeah, I guess it was two days later, is I didn't actually email the psychiatrist. Well, that's an essay sort of thing. Uh, my, my initial thought was, maybe it's shampoo that washes right out, <laughs> which is, you know, this hilarious Simpsons joke where Bart Simpson has gum and stuck in his hair. And he goes to his, his mother, um, and he says, I have gum in my hair. 
And she says, are you sure it's gum? Maybe it's shampoo. That washes right out. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, the point is, um, that was basically my, my approach to it was, well, let's hope I'm right about the diagnosis and it washes right out in a few days by just not taking any more of these drugs. Now, for, this, for a whole week now, basically, she's been, in less, much less so today, She's been really knocked out, like, sleeping a lot. And the thing is, one thing I know for sure about Rachel is that she is not somebody who sleeps well without her medication. And yet she's not been taking it. She's been just, just totally knocked out. So the thing is, that's right there a pretty convincing piece of evidence to me that there's something to do with the serotonin or the brain chemicals because... I've experienced in the past, and again, this is an SI thing, i experienced in the past when she doesn't get her drug for just even one day or something, or at most two, she, you can see her trying to spin, you know, <laughs> the crazy gets back into her eyes. <laughs> she, when she's, when she's on those drugs and they're working and everything's right, it, she, it, it, versus when it's not, there's this little weird gleam that gets in her eyes, and... And it's, it's really clear to me, like, uh, uh-oh, <laughs> Rachel's, Rachel's going crazy, <laughs> we better do something, we better, I, did I forget to pick up that meds again, you know, the thing is, she'll tell me, like, once, like, you know, hey, I gotta get my meds tomorrow, but her SI is not really any better than mine, so... She's not necessarily going to remind me the next day. And if she does think about it, then she's probably going to put off reminding me because she doesn't want to be pushy, which is ridiculous, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know, it doesn't bother me. I'm just saying she's she's so she's so uh, she's so mistake free in that area that I wish she would. I wish she would walk all over me a little bit more, so to speak, you know. Just just because I want her to feel comfortable doing so, but that's just not an INFJ way, you know. Anyhow, uh, so I emailed the message that shrank finally, and Dr. Ingram sent me back, or sent Rachel back, a, or sent us back a message that I didn't see, but Rachel saw it, asked her some more questions, she answered that. And then he came back with the same diagnosis as I had. Um, and I had informed him we were going to go to the doctor, the regular doctor, and we did today. We went to the regular doctor. And he said, it's probably this. These are a couple of drugs that, that are sometimes used to push back against this. But that if, basically, she should be take, continue taking two of the drugs and stop the Prozac because those other two drugs will actually eat up some of the serotonin, basically. So, I I screwed up telling her to stop taking all three of them because I may have made the problem persist longer than it needed to and or prevented the, the mechanisms her brain had gotten used to from eating up the serotonin. He didn't tell me any of this, that what I just said. I've, did, I, I've had to do a lot of deductive work here across the board dealing with these sort of things. Because what I'm getting towards here is that when you're dealing with medical professionals, um, they're very unaccustomed to you wanting to understand things. They very much expect you to just be told what you're told and that's it, you know. Um, and to not need to understand, to just need to understand what you need to do, right? But the, the thing is, with serotonin syndrome... There's no test you can administer directly to test for serotonin syndrome. So, I, and I didn't really know that when, when we went to the doctor today. But I'm glad we went to the doctor anyway, just because, I, you know, she, I wanted, she, we were able to eliminate certain things that I wanted to be able to eliminate. But it wasn't because... The doctor that we saw, who was actually a nurse practitioner, but whatever, I think of them as the same thing. Um, it wasn't because she did a even remotely good job, okay? It was because she had 
the knowledge that I needed to access and was, as far as I could tell, an ESTJ. And one of the points I'm making here is that to think about the benefactor 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 beneficiary relationship from Socionics. Um, ESTJs benefit me. I benefit ENFJs. Okay. So one thing that I realized as I was dealing with this NI polar that kept punching me in the face, which which I'll get to the specifics of it in a second, was that, or I didn't realize it until way after actually as I TI tool correct something it doesn't need to be corrected again uh, <laughs> I mean it, it was incorrect but I said but it, it's irrelevant to the overall story and take a little artistic license sometimes I can't I just automatically correct that shit you know it's TI tool but anyhow so I was able to get everything I needed from that doctor, even though she was doing a terrible job. So here's how it went down. I had on my phone the email from the shrink, who's a very smart guy and knows what he's doing completely, and who explained this situation to me, and I showed it to her. Now, she, the nurse practitioner, first of all, didn't even know what DMT was, which was like, okay, well, whatever, but... Um, and she read this, she read this email and then she proceeded to do some diagnostic work on Rachel, all of which is to be expected. But what became evident to me as we proceeded along the thing is that there was no framework going on here. That when she walked in the room, she was assuming she was going to be dealing with a problem that started from, we have a problem and we're, we're at a loss. And that she was going to work her way towards using her TE sort of process towards figuring out what we should do to solve this problem. And then when she came into the room and I showed her this email, well, that should have changed her frame of reference entirely. She should have said, okay, so it's almost certainly this, but it might be something else still. So let's be careful and look at a couple other things. Or at least she should have said that if, if she didn't know what I learned, she knew later, but <laughs> regardless. Um, so, the thing is, it, she read that thing, basically like, okay, she does some tests of Rachel's strength and, and her ability to sort of push back against pushing, and things like that, and then she starts talking about things that might be causing this, like B12 deficiency and diabetes, possibly, or it could be this, or it could be that, or nah, nah. And so I, I said, okay, well, let me, let me clarify here what's going on. So first of all, what you're saying is there's not some specific disease disorder, whatever that you think of, that you can think of that links directly to these symptoms in a clear way, and. There's no test you can think of to administer that if you got back a positive result would explain this in full, right? And after a fair amount of... of and, and the funny thing is how it's like when I spoke and asked these questions, it was... She, she like almost couldn't hear me. And then was like, uh, what? You know? Because what I had to ask was, okay, you're recommending all these assessments for her these various blood works and stuff being done but i want to know what you're testing for and whether or not the thing you're testing for will actually explain this thing better than the diagnosis we already have essentially from the psychiatrist who's who diagnosed it without officially calling it a diagnosis you know and she she just didn't get the idea that you would you might you might need to operate via framework to figure out this problem. So the thing is, how do we constrain each other and benefit each other and stuff like that? Well, so once I realized what was going on here, and to put it simply, 
And, and, well, I mean, this is how I, I this is how I put it to her. So what you're saying is we're doing tests for things that she probably doesn't have to confirm that she doesn't have them, so that we can strengthen the case that it's probably this. And she sort of super blinked and was like, ah, well, yeah, I, I guess you could put it that way. So, of course, what's in absence here is any sense of what's relevant. There were enough pieces in the puzzle at this point, once I had also got her to eliminate things that she needed to eliminate that she wasn't eliminating. Like, I said, okay, so the thing that comes to my mind is obviously is a circulation issue. So can you confirm to me that it's not a circulation issue? And she said, well, her color looks fine. <laughs> I'm like, okay, lady, you're not, you're not used to having somebody else guide this process. I get that, but you're not guiding it. You're not capable of doing it right. I mean, it's like, so here's the factors, right? The timing of this thing, the onset of this, these symptoms occurred in very close proximity to her smoking the DMT and then sort of seemed to accentuate after smoking it again the next day. So though that's, while that's strong correlative evidence, it's very conceivable that if it were something else that had hit her contemporaneously with the DMT smoking but was actually unrelated, that she would be feeling really bad that sort of next morning and then smoking DMT would just make her feel extra bad again because she's already sick or something like that. It's certainly very conceivable. So it wasn't enough for me to draw a firm conclusion about it. It wasn't until today that I really got all the pieces I needed to draw a firm conclusion. So in order to draw a firm conclusion, I needed to have to eliminate a circulatory issue. I pretty much did that on my own when I heard that her blood pressure was fine. But um, but then to have the, the nurse practitioner confirm it with this skin power thing you know i guess they push on it and if your color comes back right away or it doesn't that's how they tell you got good circulation i don't i don't remember recalling her seeing her push on rachel's hand like that but it is true that her it, it, she doesn't appear to have any like lack of blood in her extremities so okay i now that I, now that the nurse practitioner told me it's not circulation i can eliminate that okay well so what else do I need to eliminate? Rachel mentioned that she was concerned that when she hurt her back a couple weeks ago, maybe that pinched a nerve. This is a very SI8 thing. Why would the symptoms come on two weeks later? I don't know. But I threw it out there anyway, just basically expecting the doctor to dismiss it and make Rachel feel better. And instead, the doctor, nurse practitioner, uh, gives the idea serious consideration. <laughs> so... And, and, well, you know, could be, could be this, could be that. And it's like, okay, you are not doing this right. And then the nurse practitioner complains about the thing that I did because I'm a sane human being. I said, okay, Rachel, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to do this walk-in doctor's visit, cash pay. And I, we, I, I'm anticipating blood work. We'll pay the lab thing. Because... That's easy, straightforward. We get the actual price of things rather than super inflated price. And um, and then if it, if things get expensive, if, if this initial visit suggests things are going to get expensive, then, well, maybe maybe we'll talk about uh, other, other mechanisms of paying for that besides just out of pocket. Regardless, um... So the nurse practitioner starts complaining to us that we that she doesn't have insurance because it's, it, it makes her consider financial factors in whether or not to order all these tests. Remember what the, I, the logic behind the test is. The logic behind the test is even though we have a diagnosis in place that increasingly with all the various factors get put into place is powerful, powerfully likely to be correct, right? And you're complaining that you can't grope around randomly for something 
else that is that wouldn't explain it as well as the untestable thing with no empirics. So that even if you got test results, they probably wouldn't be specific to what's actually wrong with her right now. Even if they were specific to what's wrong with her right now, it would be less likely to be the, the cause of what's wrong with her right now than the thing you can't test for. And she's complaining to me that Rachel's not coming in as an insurance patient so that she can't order a whole battery of blood tests that she's already conceded can't possibly make a more convincing case regarding what's wrong with her than the case we already have. Now, granted, if the symptoms were to persist for three weeks, a month, or something at this point, and show no sign of changing, then we'd have to look for other explanations. Although, knowing now what I do about Prozac and its extremely long half-life of like two weeks, so it's like, that means it's all out of your system in like three weeks, probably. And it makes perfect sense that she might have accumulated, if you, if you, in other words, if you take a little bit more than a perfect or something, let's imagine, one can imagine a scenario where that stuff builds up because you're always adding more and the half-life makes it such that the pile's always getting slightly bigger, you know what I'm saying? But regardless, uh, one can imagine that scenario. And so one can imagine that it's going to take a, maybe a couple of weeks for it to go away even because she's been doing this Prozac for a long time. We did smoke a lot of damn day. <laughs> it was a blast, you know, but uh, not worth it, ultimately. Um, I mean, it's not worth it for her <laughs> to have it anyway. <laughs> it's not really worth it for me to have it, but... Um, the thing is, so... What we see here is what happens when you don't have NTPs in charge of framework. You've got this nurse practitioner who's appalled that she can't, you know, take a bunch of action without any consideration of a cost benefit analysis. So, of course, here's the other thing. When I figured this out down there, at that point, my first instinct is to say, no, we're not getting any of these stupid tests. This is dumb, right? But here's how we balance each other out. I did. I only, I only floated the idea in my head for a split second before I trashed it. Because even though I'm right about this, it was, it was a stupid waste of money to get these tests, it's worth it to me to get them so that I don't have to tell... So when we when Rachel's mom gets on the phone and Rachel's talking to her mom after we get back, I and she says, "So what? What is what happened to the doctor?" And well, the doctor said this and this, and she wanted to test for B12 and she wanted to test for diabetes. So we went ahead with those tests, even though, even though it's it's just to eliminate a couple of things, but um, you know, blah, blah, blah. well, I had to tell her that. Because and I was able to because we went ahead with the test. You know, I'm not gonna lie about it. Why did I have to tell her that? Because nobody wants to hear. Nobody, even though it's completely true, nobody wants to hear that it that it was a good idea for Eric to say no to a couple of. It probably the whole. The testing thing will come at clock in under two hundred bucks. Okay, for Eric to to turn down two hundred dollars worth of tests for Rachel, who's lost feeling in her hands and feet, because he knows better than the doctor. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody's gonna say to me, "Yes, Eric, that was a good idea." It would have been a good idea for my pocketbook. And it would have been a good idea overall for reason, rationality, logic, justice, and truth. But it wouldn't have played well. It would not have played well at all. So I went ahead and paid for a couple of unnecessary tests to, so that I wouldn't have to say that. Um, that's balancing each other out. Now imagine the world in which we don't have people dealing with each other. Instead, we've got ESTJ nurse practitioners 
spending wantonly any money that comes from any insurance of any sort without any regard for cost, no matter how pointless it is. Regardless, I was able to get all the information I needed out of the ESTJ by asking very specific questions, which I, which I, because I don't need her to resolve any of the complex issues for me. I need the specific thing that allows me to do the mental work on the complex issues. I'm clearly a much better doctor than this nurse practitioner since I diagnosed her correctly. The psychiatrist agrees with me, so I can make that claim. And at the end of this session, at no point during the session did she say, yes, you probably have this thing. You probably have serotonin syndrome. It's the most likely thing for you to have. At no point during this, during this entire meeting with the doctor did the doctor say, it's very unlikely for it to be something else. The, the likelihood of what the actual diagnosis was seemed completely irrelevant to this doctor. It was just... I do my job by ordering tests, looking at data, making you know, suggesting other tests, trying this drug, looking at data, suggesting other tests. I don't think about why I'm doing it or what it means to do it well or anything like that, except in the particulars of my habits. And I'm not talking shit about ESTJs. I think they're fantastic, necessary, hugely important people. But it was, it was, it's funny to see what happens when, how, even though she got tossed in front of her, something that was a perfect storm for her to fail at, this nurse practitioner, namely, from her perspective, she was given no heads up about, even though we told the people going in at the desk and stuff, but from her perspective, she's given no heads up about what's really going on here ahead of time and is not able to shift gears. So she's walking into it thinking this is whatever it is. It's me just doing my normal thing. Well, I, I start with a lump of clay. I walk in, I look at it, I figure out, try to figure out what it is and it, and I never really can intuit anything. So then I just order a bunch of tests <laughs> and I don't think about whether the test makes any sense to do in a larger frame of reference, I just go, well, I'm doing a great job. After all, I'm doing lots of stuff. <laughs> I'm eliminating certain things. Okay, we've eliminated scurvy. Was there ever really a chance she had scurvy? No. Then why are we testing for it? <laughs> oh, the silliness of the world. So anyway, when I factored in all the various factors and eliminated the various things, I have an extraordinarily strong case now to say that this is exactly what's wrong with her, and we know what the solution is. I uh, I regret a couple of things I did here. Mostly what I regret is not emailing her psychiatrist before we did DMT the first time to ask about this. The, other, the second thing I regret is, is basically not taking seriously serotonin syndrome until I'd experienced it. <laughs> not for myself, but, you know. Um, the other thing I regret is not seeing how much this was emotionally impacting Rachel for a few days because she, she's good at hiding shit like that, you know? And I'm good at being oblivious. <laughs> the combination of those two things. So I... I I do have a lot of regret about this thing, but I also have this weird sense of, oh, I'll never believe in the medical industry again. Not that I ever really did, but I hadn't given it much thought. Now I realize, oh my God, they're just as dumb as everybody else. They're not operating with any frame of reference. Um, they can't... How, 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 is, how is the medical profession supposed to operate when nobody's acting as though anything costs anything. It, it, it can't, you, can, we, you can't run a ship like that forever. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye, everybody. Hopefully this was not too boring. It's rambly, and it's, it's scattered, but hopefully you found it entertaining.